Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring show coming right up with special guest, Dr. Mark Beckoff, and he's here to share with us his new book, Unleashing Your Dog, a field guide to giving your canine companion the best life possible. Dr. Beckoff is a professor emeritus of ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of Colorado Boulder and is a fellow of the Animal Behavior Society and a past Guggenheim fellow. In 2000, he was awarded the Exemplar Award from the Animal Behavior Society for major long-term contributions to the field of animal behavior. Dr. Beckhoff is also an ambassador of Jane Goodall's International Roots and Shoots program, in which he works with students of all ages, senior citizens, and prisoners, and is a member of the Ethics Committee of the Jane Goodall Institute. He and Jane co-founded the organization Ethologists for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, Citizens for Responsible Animal Behavior Studies in 2000. So let's welcome to the show, Dr. Mark Beckhoff. I'm thrilled to be here, Marianne. Thank you so much. Oh, you know, as a dog lover myself, I was so excited when I got your book. I cannot, I've been waiting for this conversation. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Yeah, we're really happy with the book. New World does a lovely job on all their books. And like I said, it's, you know, it's just, it's been a real, it was a fun book to write. I mean, it took a lot of time um, and the response has been good. And I think if the dogs could thank us, which I think they can in some ways, they would thank us for writing a book on their behalf. Oh, I am sure they are happy about that. Well, and before we go too far down the road, I'd love for you to share with our listeners, what inspired you to write this book? Well, what inspired us was that We had written a book called The Animal's Agenda, talking about giving as many people freedom. Um, I'm going to start over. Is that okay? Yes, that's fine. Okay, yeah. Um, Giving dogs as much freedom as we could give them, and then the word freedom evolved into the word freedoms. And really what motivated us was that And we don't mean it in a negative way. And I want to be really clear to your listeners that dogs are captive animals. I mean, you know, we tell them what they can eat, when they can eat, um, how they can eat and who they can play with, when they can pee and poop and do everything. And so we don't mean it as a negative comment, but we really mean it to accentuate the fact that we really control dogs' lives. So whenever we can... We should unleash them, which means that they should be allowed to be dogs. And also that we really need to exercise their senses as well as their bodies. So that was really the main motivation. And the book is organized around their senses, which was an exciting venture. No no one's ever done that. And so we just basically talk about how if you're walking a dog and you pull them along so they can't sniff, it's a deprivation. So one way you can enhance their lives would simply be to allow them to sniff or once again, you know, exercise their, um, their senses. Well, it's interesting. Most people don't even consider how important it is for dogs to have their own space you know, and, and that I, I love how you bring up the whole, you know, discussion about, you know, as pet owners, we do have our dogs in captivity and we should take that into consideration. Yeah. And, and, and you're bringing up an incredibly important point, And that is that <clears throat> dogs really need safe space. You know, I mean, they really need to be able to get away from it all. As I say, maybe they're having a bad headache, you know, maybe they're just having a bad hair day. And so, That's part of an enhancement. You know, people go, oh, well, you know, if they go away, you know, from us or they hide under a bed or or they go into a corner, well, you know, they're being deprived of something. No, the enhancement is that we're allowing them to tell us what works for them. And that's what we will honor. And the deprivation, of course, would be not allowing them to... Exercise what we call agency, 
their choices and controls over what they do. And once again, you know, they have limited choices and controls. I mean, I was lucky when I lived in the mountains outside of Boulder that my dogs rarely were on leash and sometimes not even had collars. We never had a problem with any of my dogs or the dogs on the road. So they were truly unleashed. But the bumper sticker, one bumper sticker among many might be, you can unleash a leashed dog by allowing them to sniff. Um, their walk is for them, not for you. And by giving them the freedom to, I always just say, be dogs and to exercise their senses and to express their dogginess. Mm. I love that. You know, it's interesting because a lot of times when people take their dogs for a walk, they think it's just for the animal to relieve itself. They don't really consider that there's so much more going on in their time. Exactly. You know, so if your dog is sniffing, you know, don't pull them along. If your dog stops and cocks its head from side to side or, you know, turns their ears like they're on a turret or <clears throat> just stops. Let them, let them sniff, let them hear the sounds, um, let them sniff the air, um, let them taste certain things. You know, dogs will put amazingly, quote, bad, you know, disgusting things in their mouth, but they really like them. So you can unleash a leashed dog. So it's also a metaphor. Um, I've had just, you know, I've had some people say, thanks for that. Because now we think of freedoms, not one freedom. And now when I walk my dog, you know, they learn that there's a certain amount of time. It's not like they have an iPhone to keep time, but, but they will learn that they're out for a certain amount of time. And then they can spend it however they want. And have that time to sniffing. And, and why is sniffing so important? Well, <clears throat> dogs are nosed animals um you know dogs i mean do, you know i always say dogs sniff first and ask questions later um their nose is you know just incredibly more sensitive than ours and you know in a sense you could say they sense or see the world through their nose when 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 a dog is allowed to sniff you know sort of freely um they will sniff as as much as a third of the time when they're out and about, that's a lot of time. So, you know, you walk your, you walk your dog for a half hour. It's, t it's 10 minutes. If you walk or run them for an hour, it might be, you know, 20 up to, or up to 30 minutes. So it's just really important. I had a woman at a dog park once asked me a question that at first, you know, first I wasn't sure about, but I think her question was really prescient. And she said, do you think, when we don't allow dogs to sniff, it affects them psychologically. If he, they feel unfulfilled. And I thought at first, well, I don't know. And then I thought, yeah, I mean, imagine you're looking at something and someone covers your eyes or you're, you're listening to a symphony or whatever music you like. And somebody plugs your ears, you're losing information. And so um, that's why it's important. You know, you need to figure out that if they're not allowed to sniff and hear things or taste things or touch things, then they're getting an incomplete picture of their environment. And that could be extremely um, upsetting to them. Well, I, I think it's so, your book is so timely and so important to understand the dog's perspective, because a lot of times people really never consider that. Like, oh, I've got a pet, you know, we've, we've got whatever dog, and they don't really consider what they're going through and their perspective on um, being part of the family. It, it, exactly. Yeah, no, I mean, you, you know, that's, a, that's exactly right. And so if you want them to fit into a social group, you know, a social nexus, your family, or you want them to get along with dogs at a dog park, neighborhood dogs, then you need to let them have a complete picture of whatever scenario um, you know they're interacting in, and let them decide whether they like it or not. And that's you know another message of the book is you know if your dog likes something, pour it on. They like to play, let them play 
rest and play some more. If they like to be hugged, hug them. If they don't like to be hugged, don't hug them. And and it, it really focuses also on the each dog as an individual. So anybody who's, you know, I mean, I've studied wild coyotes and I always tell people that when wild coyotes come out of the den, when they're around three weeks of age, there is different as you can imagine, you know, there's timid coyotes, there's bold coyotes, they're shy, they're assertive. And, you know, they've basically come out of the same hole in the ground where they've spent give or take 21 days in the same environment with the same mom and perhaps the dads around. So what works for Harry may not work for Dave and what works for Mary may not work for Jane, but, but that's okay. Um, part of Part of the enormous responsibility of bringing a dog into your home and into your heart is to do all you can for them so that they can express their unique personalities. And boy, do they have it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Then what are some of the ways our listeners can learn to become fluent in dog? Because I think a lot of times people really get confused on what their dogs are trying to communicate to them. Well, the easiest way, you know, as a field biologist and ethologist who, you know, have studied coyotes, wild coyotes, I've done some work with wolves, I've studied penguins in Antarctica, watch them, observe them, um, you know, don't form judgments about what certain things mean, just, just watch them. Like, you know, the, I always tell people, you know, especially people I know who have had a kid, at the joy of watching their kid do something, watch your dog and watch them with a bare eye. You know, ultimately I've had people at dog parks love taking videos and I teach them how to analyze them, but just watch them doing what they do, if you will, naturally. And then by watching individuals carefully, what happens is you learn how different they really are, you know? And so you know, people who have, you know, lived with two dogs know that I've had, I just had a friend rescue two dogs who were litter mates and they're young and we were talking about it and, you know, he knew this all the time, but he was astounded that these are litter mates. They had, they'd been abused when they were real young puppies and they were as different as different could be. And so the only the way he learned this was he simply just watch them. You know what I mean? He just observed them. And then he noticed that one dog had a fear of like tight spaces. The other dog didn't care. One dog would, whenever they would, um, you know, go out, one dog wouldn't leave his side. Whereas the other one would, you know, go off on their own. So by just watching them, you can really learn a a lot about each individual. And the other thing you can do um, is become an ethologist, if you will, you know, just go take notes, take films, um, and then watch them over and over again. So there's a lot, there's lots of different ways to become fluent in dog or dog literate. Mm. Well, you know, and you can start with your own dog and figure out what they're trying to say and what they like. And your book has, I mean, it just breaks it down because you go over all the senses You know, so people are becoming more aware of what we should be looking for when our dogs are trying to communicate something to us. Exactly. Yeah. And and, and like I said, you know, just appreciate them for who they are. You know what I mean? Just just appreciate their differences. You know, another message of the book, because I think it it could be definitely um, um, it could have an effect on them is, you know, let them resolve conflicts, for example. Let them, um, uh, let them decide who they're going to be friends with, for example. And, and don't worry as much as some people do. And I, and I know that there's a reason why they do. But, you know, don't worry so much about um, if they look like they're playing roughly, for example. You know, let, let them play. Um, it's, it turns out that, you know, one myth that I hear all the time is that when dogs start playing very roughly, it invariably ends up 
in a fight, but that's been studied. And the fact of the matter is, is that it basically ex- escal- you know, could escalate into a fight less than 1% of the time. And mm-hmm. I always stress to people that, you know, I, f- I consider myself really a, pretty knowledgeable about dog behavior and I can be wrong, but the <clears throat> more freedom a dog has to be a dog and the more comfortable they feel, the better it is for the relationship that a person has with their dog. So, so it's basically a win-win for all the, all parties involved. Yeah. I'm so glad that you shared that because there have been times with uh, my past dog, Maxwell, that, you know, dog, you know, I can remember a couple of times where uh, dogs went after him at the dog park and Mm -hmm. it, it frightened me. I was, (laughs) I was trying to separate them out. (laughs) No, absolutely. And because when I started writing my book, Canine Confidential, and I am a fan of dog parks, as long as the dog likes the dog park. And that's that's a very important, you know, addition. As long as the dog likes it. I was getting some pretty I mean, I was some emails were just, you know, telling me stories like you just told me. Some were just really nasty. And then a guy at the dog park in Boulder, I live in Boulder, Colorado, said to me, I love going to a dog park, but my dog doesn't like it. And I said to him, no, you know, I know that, um, John, um, I've watched when, you know, you were, when you arrive, he looks really scared. And he said, well, I really like coming. What should I do? So I said, you come exercise your dog before and leave your dog at home. And he said, oh, you know, that doesn't feel good. And I said, well, it's, you know, I hate to say it should feel good, but I said it should feel good. Your dog has clearly told you that he doesn't like the dog park. So if you like the dog park and it's your, you know, a form of social interaction for you because because dog parks are social networks, then leave him. And he started doing it. And then one day he showed up with the dog and the dog seemed more relaxed. So I said, what'd you do? And he said, nothing. I just think he's gotten more used to me and my rhythm, and now he enjoys the dog park. Mm. So there you go. Yeah. I that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and it was great because he sort of became an ethologist. You mm. know what I mean? He, he, he kind of just, you know, became sort of a, what we call a citizen scientist. You know, he, he took the time to watch his dog. He took the time to learn how unique he was, and he took the time to appreciate the fact that his dog did not like the dog park. And now he did. And and I asked him actually, you know, it was almost like I was teaching my old course in animal behavior. I said, how'd you know that? He said, well, now when he gets to the dog park, his tail is wagging and he runs out and he greets all his friends. (laughs) Whereas, whereas, Whereas when he didn't like the dog park, what he did was he hung around the fence, his tail was tucked, his ears were back. And, you know, you wouldn't have to be, a professional dog watcher to know that he was feeling uneasy. So there's another example where he became a citizen scientist and applied it to the well-being of his dog. And when I see them now, it's they're just they're just a happy unit. Oh, you gotta love that! What a huge change that's made. Yep. Well, and I'm sure a lot of people they go kind of you know because you talked initially about your dogs and how they you know a lot of times they didn't even have collars. How do people find that balance? where they can unleash their dog and, but still be responsible pet owners. Yeah. That's, that's like, you know, the $64,000 plus question. (laughs) And (laughs) one way is to be patient. The other is to develop a mutually tolerant, mutually, mutually respectful um, give and take relationship with your dog. Let your dog know that, there's just some bounds to what they're allowed to do and or not allowed to do. And that, you know, in a sense, you know, not that they particularly know this, but that they get the feeling that there are certain areas where you have decided, you know, I, I don't know what, I don't know what, um, you know, text is going through their doggy brain, but you've decided that they can be free and they can run around and they will enjoy it. And then um, 
with some of the dogs with whom I lived in the mountains, although they didn't have to have leashes or really collars where I lived, if I walked down the road to get my mail or did something, they learned. And when I would just start walking down the road, they'd run over to me and I'd put a collar and or a leash on them. So they learned that they could be free around my house. They could be free to go down or up the road to meet their doggy friends. But when Mark came out and started moving in a certain direction, it, the, that was the cue. So that's another thing that is really nice because then people can surely learn, you know, or teach their dog that there are certain areas where we really, really need to be bound to one another. And kind of, you know, watching them. Well, and it's interesting because I used to take my dog on trail walks all the time. Mm-hmm. And in some places, I mean, they would say like you, you can't leave your dog off leash, but there would be some places in the trail where, you know, there's no way I'm holding him on a leash. You know, we just we had, to, had to go. And mm-hmm. you have to have that really, that trust there, you know, that, you know, he's actually going to come back. You know? mm-hmm. But right. And no, I agree. That's really a great observation. But, and, and, and what it always astounds people, and it doesn't astound me, but maybe because I just have spent so many hours at dog parks or on trails and, you know, learning about dog behavior is your dog will learn that, you know, the dog, dogs appreciate, I don't know how they're going to tell you to be honest with you, but dogs appreciate your giving them that freedom. And they know, you know, that, I mean, one example I use is I had a dog who I don't really know. I didn't know much about his background, but when we'd go to the veterinarian or, and I put it, or I'd put him in the car he didn't like it at first. He came to love car rides. But when I got to a trail, he would just run out and just be his free self. So he was discriminating those two uh, you know, different situations. And it really improved the relationship that I had with him. So I only learned that because I really didn't know much about him when I rescued him. But I watched him. And whether he liked it or not, there were going to be times when I had to tether him to me. <laughs> and, and there were times when he knew he'd be free. And when, you know, the other thing is when you allow your dog to make those choices and you give them more freedoms, not only do they appreciate it, but they know and learn, ah, I can see the bubble in their head. Uh Oh, we need to stay near Mark because we're going to be doing something, you know, and he needs to take care of us or wow, we're on the way to the dog park and we're going to be free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's nothing like seeing them at the dog park running off and, you know, eventually they'll come back. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, no, exactly. I mean, I just, I mean, to me, what I love about doing all of this stuff is that, I not only do I learn every you know learn about individual dogs, but I mean I've been doing this for so many years, and there's hardly a day that goes by if I take the time to watch some dogs either on a leash or running on a trail or at a dog park where I don't learn something. And and what I love too, because after um, Canine Confidential came out and after Unleashing Your Dog came out, you know. Jessica and I would be getting emails from people and I make it really clear that I am not a dog trainer or a dog teacher. I mean, I'm just not, but I love their observations. So I write regularly for psychology today and I have written so many essays based on comments or questions or observations that people make at dog parks. And and they, of course, they love it when I do it and I post it and, you know, lots of people read it and they can show their dog and say, you see, Henry, or you see, Mary, you know, you're well known now and, and stuff. But what I really like is how much that adds to the database, you know, how much how much these observations by people who love dogs really help us learn about them. And like I said before, the more the more, you know about your individual dog and the more freedom you give them, the more they trust you, the more they realize that you're going to let them, you know, exercise choice and control as much as possible. And if you have to put them on a leash, that's the way it goes. And I really believe, you know, at some level inside of them, uh, that's what they are. That's what they're saying to themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Now, do dogs live in the present moment? No. (laughs) Um, I've written a number of articles about myths about dogs, like they're not our best friends. If dogs were our best friends, you wouldn't see the rampant abuse of dogs. And I know it's a sad state, but dogs are abused routinely around the world. They also aren't unconditional lovers. I hate when they say, oh, they're best, our best friends and, and they love us all. No, they don't. If, you ever, if you've ever rescued a dog, um, you know that depending on how they've been treated, they're really, really selective in the, um, you know, people to whom they give their love or affection. So that, see, to me, that's a, the most important lesson is it's not that they unconditionally, unconditionally love everyone. It's more, they're very selective. So do dogs live in the present? No, I mean, of course they don't. I mean, you, I mean, one aspect of living in the present is, you know, you take them and you need to train them or teach them a certain thing and they learned it and they remember what they learned, which was in the past. Once again, of all the dogs I've lived with and studied, you know, they're very, very different. And I I mean, you see some sad situations like at a a local dog park where a guy rescued two young dogs and it took about took about two weeks for one dog to open up and allow people to say hello. Not that he wasn't an aggressive dog, but he would avoid people. And it took the other dog six months or so. And they were litter mates once again. And so they clearly, the past influenced how they were feeling and interacting in the present. And just think of those situations where you go walk or you pick up the leash or you throw a Frisbee or you walk into the kitchen and you don't even have to go get the food or the food bowl. They're there. Mm -hmm. So, um, no, dogs do not live in the present. And I actually think these myths really can harm dogs Because I've had people say, oh, I read someplace, you know, that dogs live in the present or I've, you know, I've learned one, one that comes back to me a lot is I've learned that dogs really are unconditional lovers, but some dogs don't seem to like me. Is there something wrong with me or the dog? And if you think there's something wrong with the dog, you're going to treat them in a different way than you might if you thought that everything was just fine. So um, I'm glad you asked that because For some people, some people like to use those metaphors, you know, Mm -hmm. dogs are Zen-like and they live in the present. Nothing bothers them and they're perfectly happy in any situation in which you put them. And if you've ever lived with a dog, you know that that's not true. (laughs) (laughs) I I do. My rescue dog, it took a year for him to be. Yeah. So I get it. And it was a lot of trust and. Well, yeah, you, know, you talk about car rides. It, it was a lot of things we had to overcome, but it was well worth it. Mm-hmm. And there you go. I mean, um, see, so you're sharing those stories with me, and I'm sure you tell other people. And it's kind of like a little network, you know, where people start talking about things because because we can make dogs into any being we want to make them into. But my purpose in life, and that's why Unleashing Your Dog was, is also in that vein, is to represent dogs as who they are, how their bodies work, who they are, um, you know, what they want and need, you know, and what they really want and need, want and need is to feel safe. They want to develop trust, and they really want to know that their human has their best interests in mind. I mean, it's, I hate to say it, but it ain't rocket science. And it's really important for, um, for people to recognize that this is what they really want. They really want to live in peace and feel safe and, and know that they're loved. Yeah. You know, and, and who doesn't want that? You know, I think anybody no. wants that. You know? No, exactly. I mean, yeah, I like how you put it just really simply. Who doesn't know that? Everyone knows it. But you see, I think a lot of the times, too, that people don't put the time and energy into really, really appreciating what it is or what's entailed when you decide to bring a dog into your home and I hope into your heart. There's going to be changes in lifestyle. There's going to be financial requirements. Um, you may not just be able to 
pick up and leave for the weekend. Or if you've been gone all day, you may not just be able to pick up and leave for the evening. For me, those kind of ground me. And when I have to change my day, I don't do it as a chore or I don't do it as, you know, with resentment. I do it because I now have a living, feeling, conscious, sentient being whose life is in my hands. And it's pretty simple. <laughs> That's a big responsibility. And yeah, I think when people, you know, when they think about it that way and they also pick up a copy of Unleashing Your Dog, it really helps them to view dog ownership in a totally different light. <clears throat> Excuse me, right. And and what I always say is, you know, it, some for some people it makes it really clear that you only own them in the sense that you control them. I mean, I don't like the word owner, but I know it's entrenched in the literature and, and that's okay. But, but right. I mean, so that's why I always say to people, do your homework, you know, like, you know, it's like choosing a doctor, choosing a neurosurgeon, buying a car is just be sure that you have the ability to take care of that dog with all your heart that you, that you can afford the time and the energy, you know, for example, yeah. that, that you have enough flexibility in your day so that if you're gone all day, like one of my neighbors, she has a person come over every couple of hours and walk the dog and pet the dog and tell the dog that, you know, he's okay and blah, 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 blah. Um, but, but I really mean that because it, it, if you don't think, really carefully, especially if, you know, it's a first dog, if you don't really think carefully about what's entailed, you could wind up just having to give the dog back and that's bad for the dog. Mm -hmm. It's really bad for everybody. It, well, yeah, exactly. And it's bad, of course, for the humans, but I'm putting the dog first there since, yeah. you know, we selected them and stuff. So do your homework. That, that's what I do. And, you know, it's perfectly okay. I mean, some people go, oh, wow, you know, I don't think I can do this. I, you know, what's wrong with me? And I'm going, there's nothing wrong with you. You know, if you've got the life you like, then that's fine. But if you've got the life, I always say, if you've got the life you like, you better be aware of the fact that you better have some degrees of freedom in terms of changing. So if you, you know, if you, if you hold one job or two jobs or you leave in the morning and you literally every day you're gone, don't get a dog. And that's okay. Cause they'll say, Oh, but there's so many dogs who need a home. And I, and I understand that, but really the worst thing you can do is get a dog, not be able to take care of the dog and really give them a high quality life and then have to return them from, you know, to wherever they've come from. It's, yeah. it's, 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 it's not good for the dog. No. Well, Mark, gosh, we could talk all day because you are such a great resource when it comes to pets and dogs. And I'm so glad we got to talk about your new book, Unleashing Your Dog. Where could our listeners connect with you and be part of your community? Well, they could find out all they need to know and maybe two more than they want to know at my website, which is markbeckoff.com. That would be the best place. And, you know, they could connect me, connect with me through there. Well, Mark, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. My pleasure. Um, thank you. And we will go from there. But I really, um, I love your stories. And thanks for, thanks for caring. Well, thank you, Dr. Mark. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you. And of course, to talk about your new book, Unleashing Your Dog, a field guide to giving your canine companion the best possible life. Unleashing Our Dogs available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. And you can connect with Dr. Mark Beckoff at markbeckoff.com for more information about his work, how to get involved, and of course, all of his books. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment In a 
a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmaryann.com for more information.